and welcome to this webinar. Today, we are going to talk about building a serverless analytics pipeline. My name is Marcia Vishalva. I'm a developer advocate for AWS. I'm also the host of a YouTube channel called Fubar, where I post videos every week, two or three times about serverless. So without further ado, let's get started. The first question I want to address in this webinar is why analytics? You might be wondering, well, this should be a technical session and why she's talking about that. But I think this is the only non-technical part in my session and I want to bring up the relevance that analytics have in organizations because analytics are critical and they have been considered the world's most valuable resource for organizations. This is the edition of uh, The Economist in 2017. So it's been already some years and it's still the case. I work in many organizations where maybe if you look them from outside, their core product was not analytics, but internally analytics were the core of the um, whole company. And why is that? Because data is the way to ask the customers what they want. Sure, you could make a feedback or ask the customers what they want, or if they like something or if they don't, but at the end of the day, data will show the truth. What customers are looking for, what customers are using, how customers are struggling with some things or not, which features the customers are willing to pay for and which ones they don't. You can also Im embed machine learning uh, with this data and get amazing results. You can try to predict the user's behaviors or what they are going to do. So data is a crucial asset in all organizations nowadays. However, there are many organizations out there that are in very different stages of maturity regarding to their analytics pipeline. And this might be because of many reasons. First, because they are uh, not really valuing data in the way that it should be valued. They, they have not found themselves that they, they need that information. I will argue about that and think every organization needs data. Then maybe it's a technologic problem. They don't know how to implement these pipelines for getting their analytics in place. And that's a quite common problem because if you look at organizations that are big and have a very sophisticated pipeline, they have huge teams of people working every day in solving these issues. So today I want to show you how you can get a fully serverless analytics pipeline and you can mature your analytics in your organization without really needing to have a huge amount of people working in this, without needing to do a lot of work. It's just very simple using some AWS services. So let's look at the analytics maturity in the different companies. The phase one, as I call it, is when the companies have not very simple way of ingest the data. They might have some kind of central login and reporting. Those reports might come monthly uh, with some delay on days because they need to be processed. They might have even some manual steps. There is a lot of manual work involved in phase one. And even if we want to get some new metric or something into the system that is new, it might take many, many uh, weeks or months to get it uh, in the reports. The phase two is where we, uh, where the organizations have an easy way to ingest the data, but maybe then they take longer to get some reports. So for example, this is quite normal in many organizations that they take two or three days to process some information because they have some systems that are not real time or because they need to do a lot of batch processing in the nights of the, organ of the data. And this is quite normal phase, I will say, for most of organizations today. Also, phase three is uh, quite normal. I would not say that is the most common. I think big organizations are in this phase three. 
where they have ingestion of data uh, and then reporting near real time. So basically, um, they can see if they're an e-commerce platform, how many customers are in the platform right now, where they are living. Uh, I don't know if you ever use uh, some analytics tool for websites that or some um, analytics for videos that you post online or in your social media, you can see some of these live analytics, how many people are watching the video currently and how many people watch it and how many people are in your sites right now and how many views you are got right now. So imagine this bad power to the scale of an organization and with all this information coming right away. And I think this is something everybody is expecting when they are working with systems, you want to have at least some crucial information right away. Because the time passes and when time passes, data lost its value. It's not the same when you have fresh data that you can take action on than when you have data that has been sitting in your, uh, I don't know, storage for two days. And that really ties with the phase four, that is the most amazing phase of all is where we mix this data that we ingest very fast into machine learning models. And here we can do crazy things. Like for example, we are a gaming company and we are collecting data from the usage of our game. And we are looking at one player in particular and our we can ingest the data of his behavior, past behavior and current behavior into a machine learning model. And we could know if that player is going to churn. Churn means that the player is not coming back to our game. So now we have a very small window of time where we can take some action in order to convince that player to not churn. We could send him promotions, we can uh, give them lives, or we can make the levels a little bit easier if we see that that's the reason why he's living. So now we have the data and we have made a prediction and we can take actions. And that's why it's so important to have data in real time. So we have many customers inside AWS and I talk about games in the last uh, phase. So I would like to mention some of our gaming customers. We have Supercell, EI Games, Glue Mobile, Rovio, Fortnite. Many, many games are using the uh, tools provided by AWS to manage their analytics and process all the events and take action on them. And if you look at these numbers, they're pretty impressive. So I think no matter how big your organization is, this might work for you. For example, here we have Epic Games that are the creators of Fortnite. They have uh, around 250 million players globally and they take around 125 million events per minute, 79 billion events a day. That's a massive number. And they are able to process them and get information in real time. Sure, they may not get all the information in real time, but they get a lot of their most important key KPIs in real time. So, Let's go now to building an analytics pipeline. So basically an analytics pipeline has some components that are shared between all different analytics pipeline, no matter if they're serverless or more traditional ones. We have events coming into our pipeline and we need to ingest them. So events are, for example, a JSON document, or there can be something else. There can be something more proprietary for your application, but JSON, uh, Documents are quite normal types of events, key value pairs, where you pass information about that particular event. So we need to ingest them into our pipeline, and that's the step one of our analytic pipeline. We have to have a mechanism to ingest and collect that data. 
The second step is to store that data. Now we have it and we need to store it somewhere. And this goes hand by hand with the process phase. So usually what we do is we store the data, then we do some processing, we store the results of the processing, we process some more. And some days the uh, events go into different tracks for different types of flows. For example, if we have an e-commerce site, we might have a different flow for the finances report than for the orders and inventory reports. They might have a totally different uh, funnel, but the events are ingested in the same way. And then finally, we have the last step in our analytics pipeline that is the consuming or visualization of the results of this processing. And that will give us answers that can be in metrics, numbers, or whatever we want. And in here, when we consume, we can also attach the machine learning step to consume this data into a machine learning model. So that will be the step where we would like to put the machine learning. So, So here we have the AWS Analytics portfolio. It looks quite big. We have many services that can help you to build your analytics pipeline. Um, we have divided this portfolio in four layers. One, uh, each of these layers represents one step in our analytics pipeline. The first one is the ingestion and collection of events. Then we have the storage. Then we have the processing and then we have the consumption and visualization. So I will not cover all of this in this presentation because it will be a very long webinar. So instead, I will cover these five services that are here in red. First one, Kinesis then Glue and S3, then Athena and QuickSight. And these are the services that I will be using for building my... And these are the services that I will be using for building my serverless analytics pipeline. So let's go to the first step, that is the data ingestion or collection of the events. For that, I said I will be using Kinesis. And Kinesis comes in four flavors. We have Kinesis Data Streams, Kinesis Data Firehose, uh, Kinesis uh, Video Streams, and then Kinesis Analytics, from which only two are kind of relevant to ingesting events in text format. There are Kinesis Data Streams and Kinesis Data Firehose. So these two services, when you look at the documentation or you look them uh, just by a, a fast uh, look, they might look very similar but they're very different. So let's look at each of the services in a little bit more detail. Kinesis Data Streams allows you to capture, process, and store data streams. That's quite uh, what we need. It has one characteristic that I like a lot, that is the flexible processing options. So you can hook to your Kinesis Data Streams to all the events that are coming in different ways to process those events. You can use Hadoop with Elastic MapReduce, you can send these events to your own instances in EC2, or you can do it totally serverless using AWS Lambda that you trigger a Lambda whenever there are new events in the stream. Then the Kinesis Data Firehose does more or less the same, load data streams into data stores, but here the processing options are more limited. You can use Lambda and you can use Glue. And then we have the different places where you can store the data that is S3, Redshift, Elasticsearch, or Splunk. But I think the best way to look at this is by looking at a table that compares these two services. First, we can look at what is the purpose of each of the services. So Kinesis Data Stream is a low latency streaming service. Basically, it works real time. Events come in, poof, it's out somewhere to be processed. With Kinesis Firehose, it's near real time. There are some buffers when we configure our Kinesis Firehose and that may con collect some events before we do the transfer of the data to the processing or to storage. Then when we talk about scaling Kinesis Data Stream, you need to do some configuration. You need to configure what we call charts, and that depends on the amount of data that you are going to stream into the service. 
So if you're planning to stream a lot of data, you need to put more shards. If you're planning to put less data, you need to configure. You can add and remove shards along the way. It's not something that is fixed, but you need to have that configuration in place. When we talk about Kinesis Data Firehose, the scaling is automatical. You don't need to know how much data is coming into your service. It just works. It's fully serverless. Then we have the capability of data storage. Kinesis Data Stream will store your data from one to seven days. You can configure how long and then you can replay all the events as they came in. So if you are doing some tests or you're some, you have some problems in your uh, after the streaming, then you can always replay all the events as they were coming in. That functionality is not available in Firehose. You can store the source events in some bucket if you want, but you cannot replay them again. You need to manually go and get all the events and do something with them if you need to replay them somehow. And then the consumers means that uh, the processing and the places where you can store this data in Kinesis Data Streams is very open. Basically, everything can be a processing and you can put it wherever you want. With Firehose, the processing is limited to Lambda and Gloom and the storage to S3, uh, Redshift, Elasticsearch and Splunk. So now we move to the next level in our pipeline and that's the data storage. For data storage, we are going to use S3. It's the best data lake ever. It's cheap, it's high available, everybody integrates to it. So we are getting all our events into S3 and that will be our data lake. And from there, we will go and do the processing. So. S3 is, I don't know how many nines durable. It has <laughs> global replication capabilities, so you can have, you can make sure that these events are available everywhere. It has really good management features, so you can uh, move your events if you want to a different uh, life cycle mechanisms, delete them with time. It's very cost efficient. You have different storage classes that you can apply to your events as they stop being useful because sometimes as months pass, we don't go to the raw data anymore. So S3 allows us to build a lot of logic into moving those through the different storage classes until we even want to delete them. And it's integrated with everything. So S3 is going to be our data lake and what we are going to use. So, I'm in the storage part when I'm talking about processing because I think the next service is a little bit in between in processing and storage. And here we can talk about two different ways of serverless processing. We can do um, processing of the events with Lambda. Basically an event comes into our fire hose and then we use Lambda. Or then we can use a fully managed process using Glue. And here is where you need to think. You can use both. Uh, what kind of transformation or processing you need to do to your events in order to uh, use them later. If you need to do something very custom or very uh, specific for your use case, maybe Lambda can work very well. But if you need to do something like it's more a transformation of the events or cleaning of the events, maybe Glue is the right option for you. So now you might be wondering, what is Glue? What is gluing together? Good question. Glue is an ETL service, a serverless ETL service for data integration. So now you might be wondering, what is an ETL? ETL means extract, transform and load. So when we talk about extraction, means to get the data from different data sources, then perform some transformation, and then we store them in some data lake. So in our case, we are getting the events in Firehose, we are storing them in a stream, and then Glue will perform some transformation in those uh, events to make them look more even or to remove some fields or add some fields or convert them from one um, format to another that is more efficient in our data lake and then it will store them again. So in the case of Glue for data extraction, we have four different uh, sources that we can use. We can 
get data from S3, from Redshift, from RDS, or from Dynamo. And then we need, when we are extracting the data, we need to build in the Glue Data Catalog a database. And that's uh, just basically putting a name to some collection of tables. And those tables will be tables of metadata. They will not be storing any kind of data per se, but you will have to define like the basic schema of the data that you are going to extract. In the case of Redshift, RDS, or even Dynamo, you at least have some kind of a structure somehow. But if you think about data coming from S3, it's very schemaless in the most way. So you need to define what is the structure of this data. So then, for example, if you have data coming from an event that you're storing in S3, that is JSON event, you can create a table with this, all these attributes as the attributes of the table. You can do the extraction of the data with glue in two ways. The first one is manually. Go to the JSON and type the attributes and put the type and define this kind of table. Or then you can use the glue crawlers, that is the automated way of performing the data extraction. The glue crawlers are an amazing feature that allows you to build automatically your data catalog and keep it in sync. And keeping it in sync is a very important thing. So basically with the glue uh, crawlers will go into an S3 bucket and they will discover all the data that is there and extract an schema definition that will be used to build your uh, data catalog tables in glue. And this is great. It's run uh, whenever you want or in a schedule and it's totally serverless. It, you only pay for when the crawler runs. So it's really cool. So now we have created our data source and the other thing we need to create is our uh, table for our destination where we want to store this data and for that we will need to do it again manually. So for the transformation what will happen is that we need to find a glue job that will say hey I want to transform this uh, table from the source to this table as my destination and then the glue a service when you're creating a job will create a Python script for you automatically that then you can tweak and will produce all the transformation. So with very little code, you are able to do those transformations. Those transformations mean that you can change the format or you can remove things or add things or combine fields. There's many things that you can do uh, in those transformations. And then the last step in the ETL process of Glue is the load process where you are going to uh, grab the data that is in those uh, virtual metadata tables and store them in a real data lake. In our case, we are going to use S3 as our data lake. So that's basically Glue in a nutshell. So now we move to the next step that is the data processing. And here we are going to use a service called Athena. We don't need much data processing in our pipeline. We glue and Athena are both services that are doing processing. So most of the work will be done by glue. Athena is important because it will allow us to do a uh, standard SQL in our uh, S3, in our data lake. So we have grabbed that information from higher host. We have transformed it and now we have nice unified events that we can then query with Athena. And we can do all kinds of queries while they are SQL. So we don't need to have that data loaded in a relational database. We can directly query into our files in S3. This is totally serverless. You don't need to do anything or you set up anything. It just works. And Athena supports multiple different formats. And when you are working with Athena, it's good to think about uh, how you can make the queries more performant. And for that, it's very important to choose some file uh, that are more easier or friendly for Athena to query. So for example, Parquet is a great example of a format of a file that is uh, easy to query by Athena. If you have to choose between JSON or Parquet, Parquet always is faster and will produce results faster. So that's something we are going to do in our demo that we are going to um, that we are going to 
transform JSON, format, uh, JSON files into Parquet, so then our querying goes faster. And this is an example of analytic pipeline. We have events instead of coming with Kinesis, they coming with IoT platform into S3, that's our data lake. Then we are doing some transformation with Glue and then using Athena and, and some machine learning magic we are getting some tables that we can visualize in QuickSight. So this is an example. We are building in our demo something very similar. So let's wait for one more uh, step that is the visualization of the data and then we're ready for the demo. So data visualization is our last step in our, um, in our pipeline. And for here, we are going to use a service that is called QuickSight that allow us to create interactive dashboards so you can add all kind of things to your dashboards, filters, drill down, zooming, all kind of things. Um, you can put these dashboards in different devices and they will refresh automatically when there is new data coming into a service. And you can distribute this in emails, in web page, and they will publish everywhere with basically one click from the administrator. So these uh, Amazon Quick Sites are basically connected to a data source and they are performing some queries into the data source. We are going to use Athena as our data source for our Amazon QuickSight. And this is really good because some of these BI services tend to have problems when you have multiple users using the services, but when you're using QuickSight, it doesn't matter how many users you have, it just scales because you're working with the cloud as your backend and you can connect it to machine learning if you want and you can do all kinds of nice things. So now we go to the demo and let's check it out. So, so if we will be live, I will tell you, please go to this web page and vote for your favorite language. But sadly, this is a recording and I cannot do it. So I will give you access to the GitHub repo of how I build this application. This is a super simple application, but it has a trick. It's connected to AWS Amplify. So Amplify is a set of libraries that will help you to build your client applications with a backend in the cloud. In this case, this application just has a connection to uh, AWS Kinesis Firehose. So I open uh, using Amplify library a connection and using uh, also Amazon Cognito user pool with an unauthenticated connection. So that means that you're getting credentials like temporary credentials to put events into this particular kinesis. That's what Amplify is helping me for. So whenever you click in any of these languages, an event is sent into my kinesis firehose. So this is the demo architecture. So I have this application. I will be hosting it with Amplify and it will be created a CloudFront distribution. So this will be available everywhere, but you cannot see it because this is not live, but go and check the demo that everything is explained there. Then the events will be going to Kinesis Data Firehose that is authenticated behind a cognito. So if the uh, users have the right uh, access, they have the right uh, temporary credentials to put events incognito, they will be able to put the events and those events are going to be stored in our data lake that is going to be a stream. The events are coming in JSON, so whenever they're coming, Glue will be transforming the events into Parquet. That's the only thing that is happening from Glue. They are transforming the events into Parquet and storing them again in JSON. Then in Athena, we are not doing much because automatically Athena will create a table. If we have a glue a data catalog table, it will create its own just by magic. So then there we could perform some SQL queries if we want, but we are not doing much. And then finally we have the quick site and there we are connecting it to our Athena as our data source. And we are creating some nice visualizations on what are your favorite languages. So, this is our management console and I can go to Kinesis. I already created the Firehose, so I will show you what is inside. And here is my Firehose voting up Firehose. So here we, um, the first thing that you will see is that the source is a uh, put. So basically I'm taking that and I'm not transforming the records as they come in with Lambda, but I'm converting every record to Parquet with glue. 
So that I need to define when I'm creating my fire hose. So it's coming from JSON into Parquet and I'm I need to create a glue database and a glue table and all that. And then I will stay I will keep all my source data and I will store all my transform files into this uh, S3 destination bucket. And that's it, all the configuration I need for my kinesis. I will leave you after this demo a link where you can see me building this step by step. I have created a series of videos, but just the creation of this takes over an hour. So I think it's better to show you the end result and then you can go and check the videos. So then uh, we are going to check the monitoring and here I just send some events. So you can see that there is some events into uh, our firehose and if you look, everything looks more or less the same because I just sent like uh, 16 events, basically 16 clicks to my favorite languages. And if there will be some errors, I will be seeing them in the Amazon S3 logs. Then I can go and show you what my glue looks and in here I will open it and you will see that I have one table, the destination. Because the way that uh, glue and firehose is uh, connected, I don't need a source. This is a parquet table, so this is the end result after the extraction. And here you can see the schema, and this schema was created with a crawler. How this data is stored uh, in firehose is using partitions. And this is the important thing of the glue crawler. So basically when data is coming into Firehose, it will be stored in folders, uh, year, month, date, and hour. And then inside there, it will be put the events. Why is this done this way? Because it's more efficient for the organization and finding things and for S3 and for later processing, it's way more efficient to use partitions. So partitions are a good practice in the analytics uh, community that they will store the events in this way. So the thing is that if you define your destination tables manually, then it will be very hard for you to find uh, the latest partitions because the partitions are changing every hour. So for that, I have a crawler that is running every hour and it's populating those partitions. So if we go to Athena, then we can see there that we have the AWS data catalog and the database is the same that we had in Glue that comes automatically. And here is the table that was defined in Glue. Same table, same attributes. We can run some queries if we want and we will get some results. We can run more complex queries. I just run a basic select and here you can see all the results that are currently in our S3. And finally, we can go to QuickSight and we can basically configure some visualizations. This is the default visualization that is the little, um, what is called ray, that it just takes some table and decides what is the best visualization for this. And it decides that it's counts of records by language. And I agree, it's good. <laughs> and here is telling me what are the most popular languages. It seems that .NET has over 25 votes, so it might be the popular, most popular language. If we are doing this, um, on, on a real conference where we are doing it live, we will see this change as people are voting. So this is pretty nice, but now I, I have a static thing because you are there and I'm here in a different time. So, as I said, if you want to know how I built this pipeline step by step, I recommend you to go to this URL. There you will find all the information, there are five or six videos on how I built this pipeline. Every video is around 20 minutes and I go by all the different steps of building the pipeline and why I'm doing everything. So, and also if you have any questions on those steps, I really encourage you to leave comments there. I'm always happy to answer in the videos. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. And again, I'm uh, Marcia Vichalva and if you have any questions that I'm not answering today in the webinar, you can always ask them in Twitter or in YouTube channel. 
in the right videos. I have my Tweety Twitter <laughs> messages open always for questions and my YouTube channel has comments enabled, so I'm always happy to answer questions as they come. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a great day and see you around. Bye bye.